break here. Uh, we'll continue on where we left off. Jesus knows we are by nature orphans, but as he prays this prayer, he knows what his mission on earth is. He's come into this world on a rescue mission so that we could be reconciled to the Father such that he could adopt us into his family. There was one time recorded in the Gospels when Jesus prays but doesn't use the language of Father. It was on the cross. Jesus cries out there, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross for the first time in eternity, Jesus lost the fatherhood of God. We sing in the song how deep the Father's love for us, that his Father turned his face away. Because at that very moment, Jesus was bearing all our guilt, all our sin, every last ounce, taking the just punishment for it, which was hell itself. And he lost the Father. But he did that for us. He lost the Father so that we never would have to lose the Father. He lost the Father so that we could gain the Father. He was forsaken so that we could be forgiven and adopted into the family. I think, therefore, there's a sense that in this prayer, Jesus does include himself in the petition for the forgiveness of our debts. Jesus, of course, had no debts of his own, no sin of his own, but the reason Jesus came into the world was to assume all our debts on the cross. So, when Jesus died on the cross, was he not indeed asking the Father, at least with his actions, if not with his words, forgive our debts? wasn't seeking forgiveness for his own sins. He had no sin. He was seeking it for our sins, sins that he had taken upon himself. He was forsaken so that we could be forgiven, restored, adopted, and heard by our Father in heaven. So these first two words of the Lord's Prayer are monumental in their implications for how we pray. Our Father. The Lord's Prayer becomes our prayer thinking this week about how hard it can be sometimes for children in a family when that family adopts a new child. You know you know, you were born into uh, the family, into your parents, and now this new person born to someone else has been brought into your family with the same privileges and rights as you have. And part of you could be tempted to think, okay, okay, you're part of the family, but you're not as much a part as I am. I've been in this family all my life, and you can't say but there's none of that with Jesus' attitude to us being adopted into his family. There's no sense of Jesus thinking, yeah, you can call God Father too, but you do know I've been calling him that for eternity, right? I hope you feel indebted to me that I'm willing to share the privilege. There's none of that. Jesus went to the cross specifically to make the adoption happen. He delights to share this prayer with us. He delights to lead us in prayer. So Sunday by Sunday, not just in the Lord's Prayer, but in all our prayer, we are being led by the praying Savior. So far we've seen in the series that in gathered worship, Jesus is the singing Savior, praising the Father in song with us. He's the preaching Savior who speaks to us through his messenger. Now we find he's the praying Savior. Listen to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. The writer to the Hebrews who told us in chapter 2 of Jesus being the singing Savior and the preaching Savior now invites us to see that Jesus right now is serving in the heavenly sanctuary. Literally, he writes that Jesus is our liturgist. He's our worship leader who, as our high priest, intercedes for us, prays for us constantly, is praying for us right now that we would endure and persevere and keep going. Jesus never stops praying for his brothers and sisters. But he doesn't just pray for us. He prays with us. Every time we gather together to pray, even remotely as we're doing right now, it is as if we're swept up into the heavenly sanctuary and Jesus invites us to join him in prayer. He says, won't you pray with me, our Father? So the reason we can pray to God as Father has everything to do with who we pray with. We actually pray with Jesus, but not only with Jesus, but with one another. When Jesus is asked how to pray, he defaults not to private, personal prayer, but corporate 
order gathered her, he assumed that his people will pray together. Jesus, of course, is not ruling out personal prayer. He himself prayed on his own. He expects our personal prayer to be frequent and ongoing. But surely Jesus' model prayer should prevent us from thinking that prayer is just a private thing, a personal thing. No, Jesus says, my people are to pray together. Here's a poem I came across written to remind us that the Lord's Prayer is not for rugged individualists. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and even once say I. You cannot say the Lord's Prayer and even once say mine. Nor can you pray the Lord's Prayer and not pray for another. For when you ask for daily bread, you must include your brother. For others are included in each and every plea from the beginning to the end of it. Never once says me. Say by Sunday, we pray, therefore, corporately. We pray with Jesus, with one another, and for one another. Those corporate prayers on Sundays tend to be led by one person, but these prayers are also, in a sense, training all of us for the rest of the week. I remember talking to some uh, pastors about the role of worship services in the lives of Christians, and one wise old pastor said this. He said, in sports, for example, football, the team trains for six days to perform on the one day, but as Christians, we gather for worship to train on the one day to perform for the other six days. In other words, again, in normal circumstances, these practices in gathered worship train us for our scattered worship. So is, is Sunday morning the only time we're, we're to be seeking God in prayer corporately? Absolutely not. To be seeking opportunities to pray with one another constantly, praying with Jesus, praying with one another, our Father. That's why we've encouraged our growth group leaders to endeavor to keep prayer as a significant part of all of our group meetings. It's why we hope to soon have a prayer ministry with an elder and a deacon available after the service each Sunday. It's why all of us find it encouraging when someone might come to us and says, can I pray with you about that? We pray not only with Jesus, but also with one another. Well, that's the bulk of the sermon, and we've covered two words of the Lord's Prayer. But let me, in the brief time that remains, talk about how we pray as I bring together those two words with two more words, doubling our focus at our Father in heaven. The first two words of the Lord's Prayer highlight the intimacy, the security, the delight of this relationship we now enjoy with God because of Jesus. But the second two words indicate that we are coming to our Father who is sovereign and powerful and in control and who has resources beyond our wildest imagination at his disposal. Our God is holy and majestic. He's the almighty God over all heaven and earth. There's nothing that we can ask of God that is beyond his capability. As the Bible reminds us several times, nothing, nothing is impossible with Four words at the start of the Lord's Prayer really set up the rest of the prayer. Indeed, they really should set the context for all of our prayer. Every time we pray, we're coming to the God who we remember is our all-loving Father and our all-powerful Lord. As John Newton famously said, such is God's power and love for his people that we can trust that, quote, everything is necessary that he sends, nothing can be necessary that he will. Let me read that to you again. Everything is necessary that God sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. God has the power to do all things, and he, but he loves us as our greatest father, so he'll only use that power for our good, even when a pandemic strikes. So we can pray with complete trust, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We can come to a complete dependence for our daily bread and our daily toilet rolls because he's the one who provides us with everything that we need. We can pray for forgiveness and protection, knowing that he is more than able, more than willing. And because we're praying to the God who is our Father and who is almighty, we pray boldly. We increasingly pray what Jack Miller calls frontline prayers as opposed to just maintenance prayers. Maintenance prayers tend to be somewhat mechanical, focused solely on the physical needs within a church or a community in a world. God wants us, of course, to pray for those physical needs. That's why Jesus includes the petition 
her daily bread and the Lord's Prayer. But if, as you notice, Jesus really front loads the Lord's Prayer with frontline prayer. Frontline prayer involves pleading with God for his kingdom, his reign to come, for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's praying for his church to flourish no matter what the circumstances, for our friends and our neighbors to become Christians. It's praying that in the midst of a crisis like this, that people might realize they're not the kings and queens of their world, that they need someone who is, and that they would turn to God and confess their sin and put their trust in Jesus. It's praying for the gospel to go deeper in our own lives, so that we would not be consumed with fear, but that we would be filled with faith and live increasingly radically transformed lives. If you study Paul's prayers in his letters, they are a great example of frontline prayers. Frontline prayer works out of the conviction that the gospel is so powerful and God is so gracious that, for example, no marriage is beyond God's ability to save, and no addict is in so deep for God to rescue, and no resentment or bitterness in our lives is too hard for God to melt, no person is unreachable by the grace of God, and no pandemic is beyond God's ability to stem or to stop. And why can we pray with such confidence? Because we're praying to our Father in heaven. But lastly, all through this series, we've been saying that what we do Sunday by Sunday, it shapes us, it forms our lives, it molds our identities. And prayer is another example of that. So we pray Sunday together, speaking the language of Father, of Almighty God who reigns in heaven. We hit the reset button on how we view God. And we do that when we pray individually as well. That's important, not least, because your view of God essentially is going to determine how you ride out this crisis, how you live this week and these coming weeks, how you handle life. If you go into the coming weeks banking your life on the God who has revealed himself as the Father Almighty, it will completely change your perspective. A number of years ago I heard this this term used for thinking about how the Lord's Prayer can mold us and change us, uh, where we, we think about how in our prayers we worship God with pendulum praise. But in our prayers we worship God with pendulum praise until we're humble and we're bold all at the same time. What do I mean by pendulum praise? Well, in the opening line of the Lord's Prayer, our praise operates like a pendulum. We pray our Father. We're thinking and looking at how loving God is merciful, how gracious, how sacrificial he is in giving up his son for us so that we could call him father. But then the pendulum swings to the other side, who art in heaven, and we reflect on how majestic God is, how mighty and high and powerful and holy and lofty. And the thing about pendulum praise is it's constantly swinging from one side to the other. All of us tend to want to tie the pendulum uh, to one side or the other. We, want, we gravitate to seeing God either as more loving than holy and powerful, or more holy and powerful than loving. But true worship involves pendulum praise where it swings from one side to the other. And the beauty of that is that the further you take it to one side, the further it will take you to the other. The more that you're able to see the extent of the love of the Father and what he's done for you through Jesus because of his love, the more his might and his holiness and his justice and power come into greater relief. And the more you pray and meditate on his might and holiness and justice and power, the more beautiful appears his love back and forth, back and forth. And that kind of prayer changes us. His might and his holiness, they humble us. We realize we are not the kings of the world. But his fatherly love gives us this unbelievable assurance and boldness knowing that we are cherished in and delighted by the God of this universe and that in turn changes how we live. There's a story about Alexander the Great which is probably apocryphal but it goes like this. Alexander the Great was once asked by one of his generals for an enormous sum of money so that he could marry off his daughter and Alexander said okay I'll give it to you. Well, Alexander's treasurer was not too happy with this and comes to Alexander and said, why are you giving this man so much money? Don't you realize this is 10 times more than anyone has ever paid to marry someone off? It's ridiculous. Why are you giving him so much money? He's asking for the stars. 
Now, I've done him the grace of, don't you understand that this man asked for this ridiculous sum of money and does me great honor? The treasurer said, I don't, I don't get it. Alexander replied, by asking for such a ridiculous amount of money, the general shows that he believes that I am both rich and generous. That is the God to whom we come in prayer. So that as John Newton wrote in one of his hymns, a hymn we would have sung this morning if we'd been together, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. I'm going to ask Bob to come. bow in prayer to our almighty, everlasting, and faithful triune God. God, our Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and Holy Spirit, our Helper, it is to you and to you alone that we bow this day, even as we are separated by space, but bound together by the love that you have graciously bestowed on our lives. We joyfully and confidently bring our praises to you. We praise you for all of your creation that we witness around us, particularly at this time of year when the temperature warms and the buds and flowers begin to emerge after the dormancy of winter. Help us to bloom and grow as we seek to help redirect our energies from anxiety and panic to love and preparation. We praise you for the blessing of the marriage of Millie and Sule in Uganda yesterday. Continue to be their guide in their life together, in Millie's leadership at the children of the children at the Joyful Heart School, and to Sule in his profession. O oh Lord, we have many prayer requests this day, and we bring them to you, knowing that you are our creator and sustainer, the author of our days, our refuge, and our strength. We pray your comfort for the family of Mary Ironside, who died on Monday after a full life of 100 years. We thank you for her life within our congregation since 1963. We pray for the many situations in this world that are getting overshadowed by the concerns over the virus. We particularly pray for those impacted by the locust plague in East Africa. Help their crops to recover those who can to provide food where it is needed. We pray for those who face persecution for their faith in you. Be a shield of protection for Christians in Burkina Faso who face severe danger on a daily basis. Surround them with your peace that is beyond all understanding. Lord God, we join with Christians around the country on this national day of prayer in response to coronavirus pandemic. As we surrender the things that have been the habits of our lives, help us to work for the common good as we come in prayer, not in panic. We praise you for giving us our ultimate hope that allows us to face this crisis without fear. For those who have suffered loss of family and friends from the virus, please comfort them. For those who are currently sick, we ask that you heal them. For those who are filled with fear and anxiety and the uncertainty of what to do, or in isolation of quarantine, we ask that you be their courage and that they would acknowledge your presence. We pray that you use this time to show non-Christians that the fear of death and the ending of that's all there is can be replaced by the hope of eternal life, a future with Jesus in it. Help us to teach and practice the Christian disciplines of prayer and praise, petition and lament that help us see Jesus in our sufferings and to place our trust in him. For those
those who are not able to go to work and have a paycheck, we ask that you provide for their needs. Please connect them with those who can provide food and other resources at this time. For those who are researching and responding to the pandemic, we ask that you pour out your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in them and through them. Help us to make wise decisions and listen to good information. We pray for our hospital and nursing home staff, doctors, nurses, lab technicians, first responders, military personnel, and everyone who is at risk to exposure as they serve and care for those who are or may have been infected. Please protect them and give them and their families peace as they serve. Help them to keep patients calm as they work and walk in faith in you. Lord, help us to use this opportunity to respond with your love to our neighbors. Prompt us to check on those near and dear to us as well as neighbors we might not have met who may need your help, our help. Help us to remember those around us who are most vulnerable to this virus and to help them by bringing them groceries or other things that will help keep them from exposure. Help us to use this extraordinary opportunity to fortify small communities of love and care for our neighbors, leading in a way that reduces fear, increases faith, and reorients all of us from self-protection to serving others. We pray for the Family Promise Program in ministry to homeless families who are especially vulnerable during this pandemic. We pray that you will enable each of the host churches to take the necessary precautions to care for these families. We pray your protection on the families, on the volunteers who serve, and on the staff of Family Promise. For those who are making decisions about closures and cancellations, we ask that you guide them to consider what is best for the people. Lord, that they will trust you and make the safest decision for the population they serve, teach, entertain, and employ. Continue to pour out your creativity on us in the methods of staying connected and productive through technology. We pray that this unprecedented time in our generation would be used to draw nearer to you and our families. With schools closed, closed and with many parents out of work or working at home, help us to use this time to rightly reset and prioritize our family relationships and our relationships with you. Let us draw near to you in faith as our Father and Fortress. Lord, we pray your presence within all the growth groups of our congregation. Help us as we take the prudent step to allow us to continue to meet together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to study God's word, to break bread, and to pray together. It is the source of our life and flourishing in Christ. It is not good for people to be alone. Lord, we pray not only this day, but help us to start and end each day in prayer as your children, friends of Jesus, and grateful recipients of the Holy Spirit. We pray that our actions will be rooted in the love that casts out fear, trusting that you will make up what is lacking in our own frail hearts, minds, and bodies. May your glory fill the earth as you respond to our prayers. And now we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day
ways that we can be serving in our community, uh, opportunities to, to seek to be good neighbors to those around us, so please be on the lookout uh, for those things. Uh, don't forget to be checking up on each other, uh, particularly those who perhaps are more vulnerable in our congregation, those who might be sick or elderly, uh, so that we might love one another well through, through this time. But now as we go into this coming week, no matter what it brings, we do so remembering that God is our Heavenly Father who is almighty and powerful and who wants to bless us this week. And so receive these words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day, this week, and forevermore.